Hello, my friends. Um, it is a treat to welcome you to day one of the Northwest Flower and Garden Show. Uh, my name is Kate, and has anyone topped my record? Uh, this is my 22nd garden show. 22nd, any toppers? Yes! Who are my people? Yes, 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 more people, more people. Um, so I am a landscape designer and a plants woman here in Seattle. And when I was a young, a young person, 18 years old, I left my beloved Northwest and I headed to college at the University of San Diego. And everyone I met along the way was like, oh, no wonder you moved away from Seattle. It rains all the time. It's got to be terrible. Well, that first year, I actually became so homesick. I was desperate to come back to Seattle. And I think Seattle missed me a little bit too because that winter, they, it actually rained 90 out of 120 days that winter. <laughs> so the thing that I realized I struggled most with, most with in San Diego was actually the consistency of the climate. Fall did not feel like fall. Spring did not have that magical luster. I think we all feel it. We like crawl out of our homes <laughs> during that first bright and sunshiny day. It didn't have that. And I felt jolted out of my seasonal rhythm. So when we talk about dynamic as a system, I just want to go through some definitions. It's characterized by constant change, activity, progress, when we're talking about a person, they're positive in attitude, they're full of energy, new ideas. So for me, dynamic in a person, in a garden, in anything, this is a wonderful thing and it's something that I miss when I don't have it. So throughout my career, I've actually met a ton of potential clients who told me that they only wanted evergreens. And I get it, I really do. Uh, winter is long, winter is wet, we have months of dormancy. But there's something about that idea that actually really completely turns me off as a designer. And it really wasn't until recently that I figured out why it was so unnerving for me. It actually harkened back to my San Diego days. Essentially, if you fill a garden with tidy evergreen hedges and, and you have no fluffy seasonal bits, it almost freezes that landscape in time. You could take a picture of it in the middle of winter and in the middle of summer, and other than just a small change in the lighting, you're not gonna tell really what part of the year you're in. So for me, building a garden with dynamic selections is what really makes it feel alive. It provides a sense of place, it moves, it shifts, and if it is done well, your garden will tell you not only what season you're in, but practically what month you find yourself in. So this is by one of my favorite writers, David Culp. Does anybody know him? He did a year at Brandywine Cottage, one of my favorite books of all time. I go back to it time and time again. Um, he is phenomenal, and he just puts it into words so beautifully. We don't work in a static art form. Plants are a living medium. They grow, they bloom, they die, and that gives each season a different dimension. The changing of the seasons gives us so much more reasons to enjoy our garden. If the seasons were all the same, we would have nothing to look forward to, and perhaps no sense of urgency to enjoy them as much. And it's just so, so, so true, and I often refer to myself as an artist. I just work in a living medium. It's just plants. So I want to start off uh, by presenting our standard four seasons. This is basic, it's simple, it's straightforward, it reflects what we were all taught in elementary school. Um, and this is actually where I find that clients go wrong. They have tracked down one item for each season, and they're like, I did it. <laughs> I got my seasonal plantings. But that line of thinking fails to encapsulate the breadth and width of life in our garden. We get too many empty pockets when we look at this as a quarterly system. So what I propose is that we think more broadly about what's happening in the garden, and I want you to think of this as our new six seasons, okay? So now, before you go thinking I'm sharing some sort of earth-shattering, momentous thing that I invented out of my brain, like, it's, act it's actually not. I hate, I hate to say it. Um, this, is, this is quite an old concept. It may not be six, it may be multiple. 
there are quite a few modern day gardeners and designers and even chefs who are on board with this adjusted way of seasonal thinking because it simply works better. It just works better. So further, we have cultures throughout the world that celebrate our seasons in a multitude of ways. Um, you know, going back to ancient Japan, they divided the year into a whopping 24 seasonal stages. Imagine that. And 72 micro seasons, some of them only lasting a day or two. Um, in the Hindu calendar, they routinely celebrate the six seasons as well. And then if we want to bring it closer to home, our indigenous coastal Salish had the four larger markers of the year that they referred to as warming time, warm time, cooling time, and cold time. But what they did is they celebrated the 13 shifts of the moon, okay? And that created a more accurate description of what their world is experiencing. So for example, moon of the digging time, this is when they would dig their, um, our native camas, which was an early starch form for them. It was really important to dig it when it was blooming, um, so they didn't dig a poisonous camas. Um, you would have the salal berry moon. This is when many of our local berries would be harvested. Um, we have the moon of the elk mating cry. This, this was signal autumn. It's when our all five uh, salmons were running. It would be the start of big game hunting, okay? So bringing this back to the dynamic garden, I think we do ourselves completely a disservice by only celebrating the four markers of the year that we were raised with in traditional schooling. So currently we're still in winter, right? But we all know that December and February in a garden are completely different beasts. We are, we are cooking with two different fires, okay? December in the garden holds the energy of going inward. We are dropping into darkness. We are dropping towards the darkest days of the year. This is our final descent. It, to me, it feels cozy. It feels, it feels nurturing. It feels like when we as gardeners also get to rest because I am not resting in May. <laughs> I am not resting in October. So in February in the garden, this carries a signature of excitement. It's a building energy. Right? We see this in how our plants respond. In February, yes, we're still in winter, but we have the bulbs pushing out, the birds become more active. So I cannot possibly design winter interest for December and February. That's ridiculous. So same thing goes for summer. You cannot compare the, the just absolute fashion show Mother Nature is putting on in May with the heat and the lazy dog days of August, right? So again, this is why we split these seasons in two. And I want to take you to a cursory walk of how I want you to think about your new seasonal garden. Late winter. This is bulbs and early buds. We are talking snowdrops, crocus, Heavy hitter hellebore, my goodness. You, if you plan that right, you can get hellebore blooming for months on end. Um, Hamamelis, also known as witch hazel. Daphneodora, if you don't have this by your front door or your side door, what are you doing? Um, next, we move into spring. This is bulbs and flowering trees. We've got our classics, our daffodils, our tulips. Cherry blossoms come on the scene, followed by dogwood, and then at the very end, we have our lilacs, personal favorite. Can't even handle them, just love them. Early summer, this is where the perennial parade begins. You're also gonna notice what's interesting about the flowers is I find that the bulk of our flowers this time of year tend to be cooler, right? So I see lots of like soft lavenders and, and purples, a lot of that, that arena. Um, our alliums, again, those are coming on. Like I said, salvias, our hardy geraniums. We've got a ton of bearded iris, Siberian iris. This is what early summer is to me. As we shift into late summer, a couple of things happen. Our hydrangeas start just, oof, my God, they, this, is their, this is prime time. Also, grasses are coming on the scene. Um, the color palette tends to shift a little bit more punchy, a little bit warmer. You get more oranges, you get more reds. Think of that red salvia, right? Um, like I said, hydrangeas are kicking into full gear. We've got echinacea, rudbeckia, uh, fall blooming, blooming anemone, and fluffy grasses. As we shift into fall, this is prime tassel and foliage season. So our grasses are tasseling, violas and pansies. We've got asters, uh, calicarpa. I get a text message on this every year without fail. Do we know calicarpa, beautyberry? If you don't look it up, it is so awesome. It literally looks like a green blob and then fall hits and you're like, what are these purple berries? And every year I get calls on it. 
Um, maples, we've got all of our deciduous trees that are kicking off amazing color. Let's talk about amelanchy or serviceberry, father gilla. We've got awesome selections, not just maples. We shift into early winter and that is where our evergreen and paper bark maples really take center stage. Um, all of our twig dogwoods, multi-trunk trees. This is when you really want these in your garden. Winter blooming camellias, our sasanguas. Oh my gosh, I can't live without them. So this is really how I want us to start mentally wrapping our brain around what a seasonal garden should be to us. So I just presented you with a mountain of information that is all good and helpful, but how do we weave this into a cohesive landscape? Essentially what I did is I took the things that people commonly message me on Instagram, text message, phone calls, I'm over having a glass of wine with a girlfriend, um, you know, people are writing the comments on YouTube. Um, what are, like, how do we do this? So the first step was really born from the points that I hear all the time, which are my garden looks naked in the winter and this is super overwhelming and I don't know where to start. Okay, solution number one, we evaluate our existing structure. This is, this is just so important. I can't even state it enough. You need to know where you're starting from. What's your current state of the nation? What shape do you want the garden to take? By going out into the garden at this time of year, we really get a clear picture of our roadmap. We don't have any distractions, right? Everything is a little bit more quiet. The next pain point I encountered was uh, my garden looks like a hot mess. <laughs> I keep adding plants I love, but it looks like a disaster. Well, we, we need to establish our color scheme, okay? And also I said color schemes in there because you are allowed to have more than one and you are allowed to change your mind. Like we talked about, early summer in my garden is in like late spring, I've got like a whole purple situation happening. By late summer, early fall, I've got a lot of oranges and deep raspberry tones and lots of white coming in. So since we are plant junkies, like that's the thing, is that we need to establish our color schemes so that when we go shopping, and I am the most guilty of this as all, I get really distracted by shiny things. <laughs> and so I have to take my color palette with me, otherwise I will bring home the whole nursery and then I will also have a hot mess in my garden. I am not immune to these rules, you guys, I'm really not. <laughs> so the next pain point I encountered is nothing is happening in my garden during insert month here, okay? So number three, you guys, we just have to get nerdy. We just, we just have to do some boring stuff, okay? That, that It just is the nature of the beast. We need checks and balances to keep us on track and to create flow within the garden. The next solution came from two different pain points. Number one, I hate looking at my bulb foliage as it's dying back and I've got giant holes in my garden during the winter. This is where we need to create a buddy system. If this is literally like elementary school when they would pair you up with someone and you would have to hold their hand so you didn't get lost. We're going to create a buddy system so no one gets lost, okay? And this is super important. It makes, um, it allows our garden to ebb and flow. It allows us to make room for plants that are dying back and having just a natural life cycle. There's nothing wrong with them. They're just living their life, doing their thing. So let's just make some space for it. And it's just like human life, everyone does better with a friend. So like, let's give our plant friends some friends. And our final item in the planning framework is born from the hardest question I get, which is what is my favorite bulb? I hate that question. I don't wanna choose a favorite child, don't make me do it. Um, when in doubt, add more bulbs. So let's be clear, I'm not talking about chucking in several hundred more of that singular variety of daffodil. I'm talking about playing out our bulb season. And if we play this right, we can, we can really gather months and months and months of changing and shifting bulbs in our garden. Okay, so let's jump right in and start with structure. Okay, who out here remembers this handsome devil? Do we, do we remember? As a proper child of the 80s, I, I grew up, I watched a lot of infomercials. This is Ron Popeil. He did the set it and forget it. Do you remember this? We are, our structure is our Ron Popeil moment. We set it and do what? We forget it. Uh, we don't actually forget it, but the nature of the beast here is we want structure, we want it to put it in place, we want it to do its thing, and then we want to go play. 
So when it comes to structure, we have two different types. We've got living plant structure, we have man-made structure. On the left, I just did high-level plant structure, so hedging, statement trees, um, or shrubs with really good form, maybe some topiary elements, something like clipped and cool in the garden, maybe a cool spiral. Um, shrubs, low-growing moments. We've got some great evergreen vines that we can grow, evergreen grassy textures. And then on the right, I really want to encourage you, if you don't have any sort of man-made structure, get a little something going on, right? Because with man-made structure, it's going to change. You're going to view it from one lens when, it, when your garden is dormant and another lens when it is evergreen. So these are your pergolas, arbors, decorative walkways, bird baths, metal structures like your obelisks, natural stone walls, art, large pottery that you're going to set into a garden. So how are we going to use structure? Um, we're going to use it to screen our undesirable surroundings. So maybe you've got like an AC unit, right? Um, we might create a room. I actually recently created a dining room and I did a little hedge wall of uh, Irish U just to make it feel a little bit more cozy. We're gonna draw the eye maybe down a path. So I did this down a curved path in my client's garden. Um, we're gonna anchor some deciduous elements by placing it at their feet. And we're not gonna be stingy. We're gonna make sure it's spread evenly throughout the garden. Not, I'm not talking one here, one here, one here. We're talking big swath here, big swath here, big swath here, okay? And the other thing I want you to remember is when we're planning for structure, any plant really, head, shoulders, knees, and toes. It's just like that old song, head, shoulders, knees, and toes, knees, and toes. This is what we want, right? This is what creates height, drama, interest, okay? And then one final note here, your evergreens are gonna become super important as I introduce our buddy system, okay? So I wanna jump in with this garden. This is a client of mine. Um, we refer to this as the Jewel Garden. And it is a beautiful example of structure that was created with Scott Eckley. He's a, he's a landscape architect. He did most of the framework. And really, this is like my platform that I get to play on, which is crazy bananas that I get to do this. Um, it allows me to go nutso with seasonal color. So for reference, this photo was taken prior to my May floral installation. And it really shows structure in such a beautiful way. So, if we take a look here, let's, let's jump through what we're actually looking at. Let's take a look at our head element. There's a beautiful stately tree up above. This draws the eye up. It's a beautiful canopy. You actually have the bark and the trunk becoming much more structural as it's coming up above this Irish U. Um, the next thing is kind of a shoulder element. This U is actually kept clipped a little bit low. It's clipped at about five feet high and it helps provide privacy from passers-by. You can actually peekaboo there and you see the, the house in the distance. There's a street that runs back there and she wants to be private in her own yard and really enjoy it. So this is what that accomplishes. And then at the very toes right here, that's a band of black mondo grass. That will be joined by just a whole bevy of ferns, but the black mondo grass is like a really nice anchoring toe moment, okay? Now let's move on to the man-made structures that are here because that is super important too. We have this natural stone platform. It adds so much texture to the space. It's also super functional. This is not a level garden at all. And so this provides a beautiful platform. Um, we also have an array of very large pots. Now I'm putting these at a, as a shoulder moment as well because right here, by utilizing our platform, we raised these, those pots in the middle, those are three feet tall. So they've literally raised this to eye to eye. And uh, it just sits right smack dab. It's just a beautiful array. And when you do a, an array like this, you want a tight color palette, you want to mix textures and glazes, okay? And we're gonna sandwich, and you can see we're sandwiching the structure. The last piece is our head moment. And this is the art in the garden. These are actually beautiful blown glass pieces. Um, the wife who lives here, her kids have gifted these to her for Mother's Day throughout the year. And I just, Love that this now is a focal point in her garden, and it adds so much interest year round. So I thought it might be fun for us to have this seminar here and then have you walk through the garden, specifically my garden or any one of them here, and take a look with a different set of eyes as to how this is performing. Because when you come here, you want something to bring home. So I wanna give you some real good examples for you to bring home. Um, so right here, for our head moments, this is just a little snapshot of my garden forest bathing. 
For our head moments, we have incense cedar, we have spruce, we have pines, we have that amelanchier, service berry, which I'm like crossing my fingers. That thing better pop any second now. It's so close. Um, for our shoulder moments, uh, we have our camellia and we have our osmanthus. And then, um, Let's see here, for our knee moments, we have a petite rhododendron, I have Lakothaway, Salal will actually grow quite tall, um, and we have several ferns, and last but not least, we have a lot of toe moments, so our Acorus, Lingonberry, Hellebore. I've also utilized a few structural moments. So for example, when you go in there and you take a look at the height of the chimney on that wood-burning hot tub, that just draws the eye right up, right? It just, it's just a beautiful anchor in that space. The other thing I've done is I have uplit the amelanchiers to use them as a structural element. If you have not used a multi-trunk tree, it is absolutely stunning and it looks totally great and naked in the middle of winter with some lights on it. It adds just a ton of drama. A final note on foliage, you really want to mix up the tones and the texture of your green blobs, we'll call them. So you're going to see we've got a lot of spiky things and we've got the smooth cedar. We have the leathery foliage of the rhododendron, and we have the glossy leaves of the acorus and the lakothaway. We have the blue spruce, contrasting against some deep greens of, say, the osmanthus. And when we place those contrasting elements together with intention, we create literal tension, and that enhances our dynamic garden. And all of these elements are sprinkled throughout the garden in both the background and the foreground to create a landscape that won't have gaping holes. It also draws your eye back and forth through it. So as you go through your own garden, think like, okay, do I just have a bunch of tall stuff in the back? What I have up close, you know what I mean? So let's create some big, beautiful S shapes in our garden. So now we're gonna move on to some like super fun stuff. It's color, dreaming, and scheming. So we've established that we're playing with six seasons, but what does that actually mean when you're planning your garden? More than anything, it means you have tons of choices, and some might argue too many choices. So we've got to narrow it down. So the very first thing we're going to do is we're going to gather inspiration. I'd invite you to re repeat this creative process every two months throughout the year to really drink in the changes that you see happening in our environment. If you do it every three months, every four months, it's going to get lost. Um, I love Pinterest. I love taking walks. I love heading to my favorite nurseries like West Seattle, Swanson, Sky, all of those great places. Um, I love hopping on YouTube and searching for garden tours for the season I'm looking to enhance. I also want you to start small. It can be super overwhelming and you can end up with decision fatigue if you try to think like, okay, I'm gonna go through all 12 seasons. No, let's just start small. We're gonna go with a colder season palette and we're gonna go with a warmer season palette. And then we work our way out from six to six seasons from there. And then last but not least, we're gonna play. A garden is never finished in my opinion. That's actually terrifying to me, which is kind of funny. I'm terrified of a finished garden. It's like, what, what, the, like what then? So I'm always moving things around. I have a poor hydrangea I've moved three times and it's still like, still doing its thing. Um, but you're allowed, I wanna tell you, you're allowed to change your mind. You're allowed to make mistakes. You're allowed to put something in and think it's disgusting and give it away on buy nothing and start over. Like you're allowed to do this. You're allowed to swap with friends. Basically, you just need a roadmap. So when I'm gathering inspiration for a client's garden, I always begin with initial likes and dislikes. I'm getting a taste for who they are. And during that initial consultation, I'm asking a variety of questions that are gonna help narrow my focus in creating a garden that reflects who they are, not who I am. That's not the goal. It's who are they and what do they need and how do they want to be in their space? So I'm gonna ask different questions like, what, when you think of a season in the garden, what, what, what colors come to mind? What flowers come to mind? What do you currently have that you love? Is there something that you pine after each season that you just have never managed to find space for in your garden? Are you drawn to cool tones? So we're talking blues and purples or warm tones like reds and oranges. Do you associate these colors with a particular season? So if we go back to my display garden, I ran through these questions for myself. When I think of spring, I think of fresh whites and vibrant bulbs. Um, I want it to feel fun and not too heavy or serious. I want to use colors that are opposite each other. So I'm having purples and oranges in there. It's like a real happy pairing for me. And what do I have and I love? Well, for this show, we have bulbs, bulbs, and also more bulbs. 
And, but I also wanted it to be a forest, so I'm gonna play with lots of evergreen texture to make it sure it doesn't feel flat. Um, and what do I pine after? Personally, I don't have an amblanic here in my garden. I've mentioned it 700 times already. I want one, so I got one for the show. And um, I also love witch hazel. Um, it's called Jelena. It's one of my favorites. It's an orange flower, it's super great. So I'm drawn to cool tones, but I need attention of a few warm pops to keep the garden from looking too flat. So let's see what we came up with and how it translates into two seasons of color. This is my start point. Over here, we have kind of the spring display as it is right now. This, it's a tightly considered palette. I don't have too much color going on. It feels collected, it feels spring, it feels vibrant. I've got my orange, I've got my purple, and I have some white. It feels soothing, but it's still happy and cheerful. And I feel like this doesn't take itself too seriously. I wanna feel like anybody can come in and sit down and have a good time. I wanna know though, is this gonna to translate to fall and winter? And actually, I, I think it does still hold water. We harness spring, but over here, I actually swapped out my tea camellia for a camellia setsugeka. This is one of my favorites. It blooms white at Thanksgiving time. Um, but we have a lot of tension. So tension with the blue spruce foliage and the brightness of that cornice midwinter fire. That's one of my favorite uh, twig dogwoods. And as it stands, I think this design still holds water. So now it's time to expand out, right? So we have two palettes and now we're expanding. When we expand, we start to get nerdy. Okay, so here we go. We're gonna get a little unsexy. <laughs> this is spreadsheets. <laughs> and I know some of you might get really excited by spreadsheets, I, I don't. Um, so this is just some very basic Excel work here. This is what I use on every single project, okay? And let me assure you that this is nothing fancy. Um, and anyone can do this. Essentially down the lift, I'm gonna put my plant list, everything that I have in the garden, everything I wanna bring in. And across the top are your six seasons. You're simply gonna check the box when it's flowering, when it's got some cool interest going on. Fall, our twig dogwoods don't have a flower per se, but that is just killer interest. So I'm gonna check fall, I'm gonna check early winter, I'm gonna check late winter for that cornice. On the very far right, sometimes I add a column for evergreen elements. That's super important when, if you have a teeny tiny space. If you have a courtyard, if you have a townhouse, you're gonna need your, your items in your garden to do more heavy lifting, okay? Now, depending on how your brain works and what feels good to you, this may be enough. For me, I like to be a little bit extra and go full blown plant crazy. So I expand it out even further. I will literally go through every month of the year to make sure I am covering for my clients. And even though I'm a professional, I, I still do this, right? Because I can only hold so much information in my brain. So this is for our next level folks who want every square inch of the garden covered. And so let's go back to my display garden and let's see how that actually works in application, right? So I, I want this just to be like applicable. All right, here we are. So this is actually not bad. We are constructing gardens here for peak enjoyment at the show. I mean, this is like, this is, this is one of those things where we wanna give you guys bang for your buck. We love having you here. Um, but what I've been able to do is actually plan for almost a year of color as if this were a functional garden. So as expected, we've got a really strong late winter and spring game. Um, I've also mirrored our structure head to toe framework going on. Um, but one thing is we are gonna notice I've got a hole right down there in August, which is hilarious to me because I find August so easy to fill. But in this garden, because it is so spring focused, I created myself a hole here. So what do we do when we find a hole in our garden? Well, simply, we're gonna go back and we're, we're gonna repeat steps two and three. We're gonna get inspired, and then we're gonna refer to our spreadsheet. So I'm gonna encourage you to do the same things. Go for a walk, um, hit up Pinterest, maybe go to the nursery, but be careful when you are at the nursery. We love to present <laughs> tempting little nuggets for everyone to purchase. <laughs> so pick up that tag. They've all been cozy and greasy houses. Pick up that tag flip it over, see when this thing is actually gonna be blooming. A lot of times uh, the showy things that they put right by the front doors that get us drooling, those have been forced on a little ahead of the game to make sure that they go home with a new friend. 
Okay, so here we are. We have come to the part of the show where I need to fill in my August gap. So I did a little um, adjustment of this palette. On the left, this is my early summer garden. This is what my summer's gonna look like um, in the first part, so we're talking May, June, maybe into July. On the right, this is my fall story. So like just killer fall foliage, great texture. But what am I gonna do in the middle? Well, for my eye, I'm looking at this going, dang, I got no flowers in early fall. Okay, so maybe I need some florals. I think I want at least two florals. Maybe I want some more texture. Um, so the other thing I look at here is I look at where my color is happening. Okay, so I'm coming out of early summer. Well, you can see I have this little Viola Labradorica on the right, that's one of our natives, that's gonna be going on. So that's like our little toe moment. Thelictrum meadowroo on the left, that fluffy little purple bit, that gets quite tall, right? So that can get like three, five feet tall. Um, we also have GMs, which is more like a little like shin moment, really, if we wanna call it. So, what I'm gonna look for when I go to my garden center is I'm gonna narrow my focus even more. I'm gonna bring these color palettes with me, but I'm gonna think in my head, okay, I need a knee moment, right? I need something to fill in that level. So what am I gonna look for? Well, I might be inclined to do um, Bugbane, Actea, Hillside Black Beauty. It's lovely, it's dark and bronzy, it's got a big you know, frothy white thing coming out the top. I might want to lean in and add in some Rudbeckia just for that like deep, deep gold. I love that. I might also be tempted with some Anemone Honorine Jobert. This is a must have in my garden. I love it. Um, also asters might be really pretty here as well. Okay, but with asters, make sure you're checking your heights, right? We're going for a knee moment here. We could also consider adding maybe an oak leaf hydrangea for more of that shoulder moment. It would be delightful in a woodland setting. And one thing I'm kind of missing here is I am missing a bit of a head moment. I'm gonna get that coming in with the fall color with my um, service berry and my, and my um, witch hazel, but I could do something better. So I might bring in a metal structure and grow an evergreen clematis there's one called um, Sweet Autumn Clematis. It blooms white. That would be sensational, and that would draw the eye up. So we're not going through the garden peeking down at the ground level. We're drawing our eye up for some more interest. So I think that actually would be a good one. So before we jump into the buddy system, I wanna give you like a PSA, right? These are my rules. You make up your own rules, right? This is what works for me when I'm designing. And even sometimes, I will still break my rules. And when working through designs, I find that there are just certain combinations that work for me. And knowing what combinations you like is gonna help you de your design come together. And there's no shame in working with what is a proven combination in your garden. There is tons of creativity in how you actually pair these elements together, right? So here are my rules. I pair foliage, and florals. Next, trees need shoes. They just do. Trees need some shoes. Uh, bulbs and perennials make magic. Alliums and grasses forever, ever. And then plants need friends. So jumping into foliage and florals, these are a wonderful combination. And for me, what this combination does is it's about letting the plant just be a plant. It's letting it do what it wants to do, right? We're not trying to ask it to do everything and be everything to our garden. No, we're gonna have this be a foliage and we're gonna have this be a plant. Just give it one job. Um, so this is best done with one element being evergreen. Um, great evergreen foliage choices, Lakothaway, boxwood, choicea, osmanthus, hookra, sedges, ferns, liriope is great. Non-evergreen foliages that I like to use, um, Miscanthus Morning Light. If you don't have this in your garden, I love it. It's fantastic. You should have it. Um, Ladies Mantle is an old-fashioned choice, but it will be in my garden forever. Um, lots of different lavenders. These are semi-evergreen. Hakonicloa, Japanese forest grass. Amazing texture in the garden. And of course, hostas. Can't live without hostas. So 
like I said earlier, pairing these two things together, it helps them shine. So there's no, there's no competition. Your foliage isn't pretending to be a flower. Your flower is not pretending to be a foliage. They are just letting each other do the work and they're supporting each other in that partnership. So I wanna bring it back to my display garden to give you just a few examples. So up top, we have Lakothwai Scarletta, and I planted this around the base of a Hamamelis, a witch hazel. So flowering moment up top, evergreen moment below. You could also do the same with, um, on, the, on the bottom we have Blechnimus Bacant, it's a deer fern on the left, and we have Thalictrum or meadow rue on the right. Again, we've got texture of the fern, we've got the height and the drama and the wispiness of that meadow rue. Next, trees need shoes. When planting the base of the tree, this is really a missed opportunity that I see a lot of people do. I, I like kind of cringe when I see like grass, 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 and tree in the middle. It's like, he's so lonely. Give him a friend for crying out loud. So deciduous trees, um, I like to plant them with a skirt of evergreen elements. It helps anchor it into place, and it can also work to conceal any uplighting that you might have. Evergreen trees, when planted with perennial elements, so now we're gonna flip-flop it, evergreen trees with perennial elements helps that evergreen feel more seasonal, right? So we're just kind of working in our little reverses here. So now let's take this back to the garden just to see where we're at. I'm gonna give you two different examples of this. On the top, this is the combination at the entrance to my display. So I've got those beautiful service berries that are multi-trunk, they're sculptural, they're lovely, and I've planted them with a big swath of, this is a chorus ogon. It's an evergreen grass, nice glossy leaf. This will eventually form in a garden a beautiful, like think of it as like an evergreen shag carpet of all these amazing fan shapes, right? It's just a really beautiful heavy hitter. Now my third amelanchier, is planted along the pathway. And I've done something a little bit different. I've planted it with this one. This is Osmanthus delavii. And this actually sweeps. It starts on the left. I've got five of them. It starts on the left, sweeps back behind it, and comes forward. Now, I wanted to do this for you guys so that when you go back there, you can see the effect that it has in the garden so you can bring this home and repeat it. When we have evergreen elements planted in front of the tree, it is helping recess it back into our border and our landscape. When we make a sweep behind a tree, it actually like pulls it forward. It kind of like puts it in a little picture frame. It like serves up on a platter for you. Like, hey, like check this out. I am actually super stunning and I'd like to have more attention, please. Does that make sense? Next, bulbs and perennials. Every year I am asked when it's time to cut back Foliage, sometimes I'm asked by the same people multiple times, and I think they keep asking me because they want a different answer. And the truth is that we need to allow the foliage to die back. It is a necessary part of its life cycle. And so if it's needed, then we might as well disguise it or make it look a little bit better. So what you're looking for in a pairing is a plant that is emerging as your display of bulbs is nearing its end. Does that make sense? So we're like, peak, 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 bulb. And then as soon as we start to drop down, that's when we want our perennial to come on, right? So this is like, this is like an orchestra, right? So like, it's like, oh, our strings are going. Okay, strings are dying down. Okay, horns, come on up over here. That's what we're, that's what we're working with. And so what happens is we naturally are gonna look for the new shiny object and the excitement that new plant brings and that emerging foliage it also helps disguise some of those ratty bits that we kind of don't want to see. So examples in my garden, I, I don't have a whole lot in my garden out there just because of the nature of what it is, but I want to bring in a couple of things. In my personal garden, I love tulips and catmint. Catmint gets big and bossy and it kind of just covers everything up, it's lovely. Um, this is one combination that I have in a container in my garden. I have little daffodils uh, paired next to, this is actually a Sambucus, an elderberry, called Golden Tower. This is stunning for like upright fo feathery foliage moment. It's awesome. And as soon as that, that um, daffodil foliage starts to look kind of crummy, this Sambucus is just firing. It's on all cylinders. It's stealing the show and no one's paying attention. And then on the right, this is a, um, this is a Toto 
daffodil. I love little tiny baby daffodils next to my hardy geraniums. Again, as soon as they're over, that geranium is, is full speed off to the races, right? So alliums and grasses, this is a love story for me. I love it, I use it all the time. And it was born because I don't like the foliage of an allium. I'm just gonna come right out and say it. Um, they are so whimsical, they're so fun. Um, if you time this correctly, you can get a super display because not all alliums bloom at the same time. And like I said, their one drawback is the foliage. It yellows always, always, always before it blooms. There's nothing wrong with you. You've done nothing to like dishonor this allium. It, it, this is just what it does. And so some people will actually go back in and snip off the, the brown bits. I can't be bothered. I have too much other stuff going on. And sometimes I just need to be lazy in my garden. And so this is where I start pairing it with grasses. I also think it ends up looking like you have a bunch of lollipops in your garden, which is not a look I'm going after. So if we want to get really granular and specific, I'm absolutely obsessed with alliums and penicetums. This is our top pairing. So we have a Globemaster allium on the left, and this is Penicetum Carly Rose, and it is so lovely. And it just starts to take off. It disguises the ugly bits, and then you look like you have these little pom-poms waving up in the air. The one down below, this is more like dainty on dainty foliage. On the left, this is a drumstick allium. Do you guys plant this ever? Oh, I love it so much. And that drumstick allium, what's also cool about it is you get the green and then it goes green purple and then you get the purple. So it just keeps, it keeps producing for you. And I love to pair this with Mexican feather grass, which is um, Nacella tenuissima. And that's a really just super awesome pairing. But what you're looking for is you are looking for a grass with a thin, wispy blade. We are looking for movement, 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 okay? All right, finally a word on plant friendships. Plants need friends. Even if you plant a statement shrub or a tree, it still doesn't wanna be alone at the party, so we gotta give it some friends to hang out with. So rule number one, purchase multiples of plants. If you see something you love, please don't buy just one, please. I don't wanna to come to your house. <laughs> I want you to purchase three. I want you to purchase five. I want you to purchase seven. Odd numbers are more pleasing to the eye. If you go through a lot of the gardens out here, you are going to notice this pattern. It's because we are going to invest in a plant, a season enhancer, and we want you to see it, right? If we're gonna invest in this plant, let's show it off a little bit. Number two, remember to go for big, bold, impactful drifts in organic shapes. If you're planting, say, a border and you want to repeat plants, which I highly, highly, highly recommend, don't think they all need to be in groups of three. You don't need three, three, three. That's boring. I want you to think, okay, maybe I'm going to do five over here. And maybe I'll do like three kind of in the middle. And then maybe I'm going to punctuate this end with a drift of seven. You want the impact, but you don't want it to feel samey. That's boring. And also like no one is the same, right? So let's mix it up a little bit. It also helps your seasonal impact feel like it pulls you more through the garden, right? It feels a little bit more unexpected. And so you're more likely to travel down that path, travel down to that water feature. You know what I mean? Now, the number three, stiff and loose is a beautiful balance. And that's really, again, we're talking tension in the garden, okay? So for example, a low growing um, taxus, like taxus densiformis, rapandens, if you plant, say anemone honorine chaubert in the back of that you're going to get that beautiful structure but in the fall you get these beautiful tall wispy moments that are sensational and provide movement you could also pair that same taxis with your japanese forest grass your hot conicloa and again static element movie breezy drifty okay so those two that's where you create that tension and that's where the magic comes from in your dynamic garden number four the number one culprit to big swaths of dirt in the middle of winter is too many perennial elements grouped together. So yes, this is fun, this is floral and makes a big statement, but does it allow your garden to flow? What I want you to do is I want your perennial paired with a little evergreen element, okay? Give it a buddy, right? If you just do like perennial, 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 perennial with no evergreens interspersed, you're gonna have naked patches, and we don't want that. 
All right, last but not least, we are, we are winding down. When in doubt, add more bulbs, okay? This is a personal motto. <laughs> Maybe it's a vendetta, I don't know. Um, but this is such an easy way to add a seasonal display that is going to take you through, I would say at least halfway through the year, maybe even more, okay? This is literally the easiest way to add seasonal color and interest to the garden. And so that means if you still insist on having a garden full of evergreens, just do this. Just do this. That's all I want you to do. If, if everything else feels like too much, start here. Um, this will still leverage an amazing dynamic garden for you. When it comes to color, so number two here, when it comes to color, this is also super freeing. Does your summer color palette center around cool tones? Well, you can go full hot colors with your early bulbs. You can bring in the bright yellows, red tulips, and those are gone by the time you've got your lavender, your catmint, your geraniums coming on the scene. Okay, so it gives you lots of flexibility. The next thing, you're gonna combine heights and shapes for added interest. And this is bonus point territory. If you're like, Kate, I can only pick one daffodil, that's all I got in me, in fact, you have done well. But I would like to push you a little bit. I would like you to push you. And so let's talk about daffodils, for example. With daffodils, I love pairing a miniature daffodil, so that's like a tete a a toto, a jack snipe. You're gonna pair that with a taller specimen, like a Mount Hood, something like that, okay? That's gonna create a lot of interest just in a little bulb pocket. You can also do like smaller discs, so like there's like some sundial discs or like a, there's little tazettas. Those also look great when paired with a large element like a Dutch master. That's another great example. There are also some super fantastic roughly centered ones. I don't know, have you guys seen these like super roughly centered daffodils? I love replete if you like that peachy tone. Replete is great. Delnashaw is another peachy one that's super great. Um, you can also do white lion. That one is lovely. It comes out more yellow and then it fades to white. So again, I want you pairing your different types of tulips together. They're all, or daffodils. They're also gonna extend your season. For tulips, the same thing happens. You've got early bloomers and late bloomers. And I love to pair a classic with something a little bit more funky. So again, contrast is king here. So I personally start my tulip season with exotic emperor. It's a white, but it has these streaks of green that come up through these blades on the outer edges. It's really, really stunning. I let that steal the show, and then I move into these really classic Darwin shapes that are like, if you told a five-year-old, I would like you to draw me a tulip, they would draw that, okay? And what that does is it gives me the sense of both of these things, and my emperors are long gone before my peach ones come up. Now, with alliums, this is where we can have tons of fun too. I always plant three, always plant three different types of alliums. I want a small, medium, and large globe. Okay, likewise, I want something shorter. So if we're looking for something shorter, it might be like a Christophii. That one looks like a big firecracker and no one ever uses it. I, I really don't get it. And it's about a foot and a half tall. Then I'm gonna do a mid height, like a Mount Everest. That's white, it's about two feet tall. And then I throw in a really tall one, like a gladiator that's gonna be over three feet. If you just simply hop online and you do a quick Google search for um, like Allium Bloom Guide, it'll, it'll showcase just the bevy of bloom times, sizes, heights, all of that. So what you're gonna do here next is you're gonna zone your selections. This one is super fun because this is how you also create a more dynamic garden. I create tons of zones in my garden. So out front, I have like a lot of light peachy tones with some super deep midnight tulips for a lot of drama. Um, you could also have a walkway surrounded by all your little petite offerings. I, um, I also filled a driveway once. It was nothing but like a giant line of lavender and dozens and dozens and dozens of alliums, three different kinds, and it was beautiful. Um, the next thing I want you to do here is utilize pots to your advantage. I don't know if everyone agrees with me here, but some people really just cannot stand to watch foliage die back. And so I'm gonna encourage you to plant your tulips in a pot and then plant that pot into the ground. 
And then once it's done, if you are a person who can't handle the mess, you just pick it up and you put it behind a shed or somewhere else where it can just go dormant in peace, okay? Now, one thing I will say, do you guys know Klaus Dalby? Do you know him? Okay, your homework is to go on Instagram and look up Klaus, C-L-A-U-S, Dalby. He is like the king of color combinations. All you need to do is scroll through his little page and you will have color combinations galore. It is literally just pick your, choose your own adventure. It's fantastic. Okay, last but not least, always check your bloom times. I touched on this earlier when going to the nursery, but this also follows suit for daffodils, tulips, and alliums. You have late, you have early, mid, and late bloomers in all of these categories. So you wanna make sure that to have the most dynamic presentation, you're picking one from each category. If you pick all late season tulips, you're gonna have a little bit of FOMO as everyone is enjoying all the rest of their tulip display and you're like, okay guys, anytime now. I've done that, I have, <laughs> so this is why I can tell you. On the right, I just wanted to give you a brief overview of in order, loose order, obviously we've, we've discussed, we've got earlier than lates, but this is how we're gonna see our seasonal color come through. And if we play this right, we can get from January all the way through to July with different awesome stuff happening. So galanthus or snowdrops, crocus, iris reticulata, we've got serious daffodil parade, muscari, hyacinth, tulip, fritillaria, lots of alliums, and then even lilies. Um, I'm super into Mardigan lilies right now. I'm obsessed with them. They're fantastic. And they're just like, they're just yummy and you don't see them enough. Okay, as you can see, I have just created a little modified bulbs that are in my garden and how I would plant this in my personal garden. So I would add snowdrops and crocus. I didn't have room for those in the show. I have tons of iris reticulata. I've got several daffodils. I've got tulips that are on approach. And then if this was in my garden, I would throw in some alliums in the late season. Okay, and what you can see also, see what I've done here? I start really white, fresh purple. And then that purple iris reticulata, it's got a little bit of yellow in it. That one transitions to all my daffs, okay? And then that later daff in the middle, that one's a daffodil called geranium. It's got a little orange eye in the middle. That's gonna weave right into my orange tulip. Next, my orange tulip's gonna be going, that's Princess Irene. See that little purple flame in there? That tees me up for my allium party that's gonna be on approach, right? So you can see how like the eye is really gonna have a lot of really interesting things to look at if we're just playing with bulbs and nothing else. So there you have it. You just drank from the seasonal color fire hose. Congratulations. <laughs> you literally have sped through a full on dynamic garden immersion course. I hope you were able to take away some little goodies and new ways of looking at your garden. Um, I would love for you to come visit me um, in my garden, kind of see some of these practices in place. And I love connecting with all my plant people. So hunt me down on Instagram, find me and subscribe over on YouTube um, and Happy gardening. I'll see you out there on the floor.